The views and opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect those of Access for Wayne, the Allen County Public Library, or any other supporting groups. If you'd like to produce a show, call us at 260-421-1250. Hello and welcome to the American Veteran. I'm Dale Parrish, your host, with my co-host Bud Mendenhall, and our guest today is Dr. Russell Gilliam. He is involved with the Rain, uh, Civil War Rain Actors. Uh, Russ, how did you get so involved with the Civil War and the Rain Actors? Well, I've always loved history. I loved our military history. Uh, I've enjoyed the outdoors and being outside, and I like shooting also, so this was the perfect combination for me. And I'm with people that like the same thing. Well, that's, how, how, many, how many people are involved this year? What is it, the third, they call it the 30th? Yeah, 30th Indiana. We have probably about 25 people in our group. Uh, men are mainly, but we do have a civilian uh, part, and they're, they're ladies in there too. What, what, uh, what do you got for us today? Well, today I'm going to uh, talk to you about the Western soldier, which was different than the Eastern soldier on the East Coast. Western would be like Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, and uh, we played a significant role. And this part, we're just gonna talk about the uniform and what a typical infantry soldier would have worn and had. Just to give you some background, there was about three million men served in the Union Army. Um, about 70% of them would have been 23 years old or younger, so I would have way exceeded that. And there were, there were some people that were older, but most of them were 23 or younger. The average height was five foot eight, and the average weight was 145 pounds. That was an enlistment, and that drop, weight dropped significantly after being out in the field. Um, most of them were farmers, and uh, of course that's where the Midwest is from. And the private's pay was a whopping $13 a month when you could get it, and they had, did have pay difficulties. We're gonna talk next about our uniform, and it, you're an infantry soldier, so everything you had, you carried with you. So weight was critical. You didn't take anything that you didn't need. Uh, one of the main things we have to have, which is a, a different than the Eastern troops, we wear a slouch hat that looked like that. Very practical, it protected you from the sun and rain, and uh, it was a little more casual. Each soldier had their own little uh, nuances to their, to their hat and very different from the Eastern soldier that wore the kepi. The next thing of importance was the bedroll, and this is, I have around my shoulder here. Uh, you would carry uh, your blanket in here and you would also have other items of clothing, maybe a, chain, a shirt or a change of socks. If we could go right over here, we would also have a gum blanket, which looks like this. It's just a, a rubberized piece of canvas as a ground cloth to protect you from the rain. This is just another example of a blanket. And then uh, our brogans or shoes, these were typically would only last about three months before they disintegrate. They had a steel heel plate on them and leather, but at least the Union troops mainly had shoes. The Confederates didn't. Uh, the uh, canteen was an important item too. Let's go back here, uh, bring this around. You can see this canteen. And a lot of times you didn't have water. And the water you did have was typically polluted water. That's why most guys were sick most of the time. Uh, also, we have a haversack right here with my cup. You always had a cup along and uh, for coffee or other beverages. And on this table here is the contents of the haversack. This is everything a soldier would have had in there. And uh, we have uh, our plate, some silvering eating utensils, the famous hardtack crackers. They called those tooth breakers, worm castles, 
Uh, steel plates, they were very, very hard and they were infested typically with bugs. So most of the things you carried were food. You had some peanuts. Uh, they actually, during the uh, Civil War, they began having desiccated vegetables. So that would be like dried vegetables that we know of today. Coffee was important. You had corn. There's a little bag of beans here. I have a little container of tea. So that was about the main food items, and you may have a piece of uh, meat, but whatever you could find and forage on the field was what food you had. Also, uh, for grooming, there is typically had a comb in there. Uh, here is a very important item right here, a wad of uh, chewing tobacco, and that was a good trade item. And we also had our billfold and a little bit of money here. And uh, very important, almost every Civil War soldier either had a prayer book or a Bible. There was a song book, uh, and that was the main entertainment for a soldier was singing. They knew a lot of the songs. And maybe a letter from home. And those were very important. This is, this is everything he had with him, and, and it was an important item uh, to have the haversack and have all these special items in there. The uh, next item, and this would be more of a, the combat item, would be the leathers, which we call the waist belt and the cartridge belt. The cartridge belt uh, had not only the support of uh, your equipment, but it helped to hold everything together so it wouldn't flop around. This is the cap box to ignite the rifle, which I'll go through here in a minute. You had your bayonet over here, right here, and the bayonets were used mainly as tools, very little in combat, but they were handy for digging holes and cooking meat on, so it was a handy tool. But a lot of the units in the Civil War just threw them away because they weighed extra, extra weight that you had to carry along. Um, we had uh, the cartridge box, let me show you this. This is what carried your 40 rounds of ammunition, and you had a little tins in here with the uh, paper wrapped cartridges with your gunpowder and uh, show you what that looks like had these little tins you had an upstairs and a downstairs with uh, 10 cartridges in each one and each one of those fired a bullet that looked like this it was a mini bullet and it had 60 grains of black powder and this is one ounce lead and this would be fired in a rifled uh, uh, musket like I have today, which I'm going to talk about shortly. It looks close to a half inch. Diameter. It's uh, right. It's five seven seven or five eight. So it just depended on if you had an infield or a spring field. Well, we can talk about that right now. This is an infield rifle at the beginning of the Civil War. Uh, very few arms were available, so many rifles were purchased from England, and a lot of the United or the units in Indiana had infield rifles. Ours did. And these were a, a well-made, very accurate rifle. They had rifling in them. And then that uh, mini ball that we talked about, his, his name was Claude Manet from, but in the United States they called it Mini. Um, he designed this back in the 1850s. And this open-based bullet actually expanded. I don't know, it's hard, maybe hard to see, but it actually expanded with the pressure of the gunpowder, engaged the rifling, and had a spin on it which made it much more accurate and much more of a um, uh, accurate and longer distance for shooting. So the technology of the time exceeded the tactics of the time, which we're going to talk about later. Our other items, uh, people are appalled at you're wearing this wool, what is it? but it was a very practical uh, material. It was very durable. If it got wet, uh, you stayed warm. So you had wool pants because you're not walking on streets. You're walking through brush and briars that protected your legs. The jacket was, uh, it was warm, but you were protected from the brambles and the brushes. And then underneath you had a, uh, either a flannel or a cotton shirt that I'm wearing. And uh, sometimes you had long johns if it was cooler, but uh, most times these wore out and they didn't have them. Uh, you had wool socks also. And you're, if you were very fortunate, you had two pairs of socks and maybe an extra change of shirt. But you pretty much wear the same thing all the time, sleeping, high, uh, marching, and uh, just doing your regular duties. So you really didn't have a lot of extra as far as clothing. The um, rifle, again, uh, was later replaced by the Springfield rifle, which was made in the United States. And that was later in the war, probably starting 1863. But 
what I portray and what we typically use was this infield rifle. We had to carry everything, so you had to go very, very light. So everything that was not necessary, you, you got rid of. These uh, men had a very difficult time. If you can imagine the typically, typical infantrymen, I would have been a, a very hale and hearty person. Uh, most of the troops were, had some kind of illness. Either they were uh, having some kind of digestive problem, diarrhea, or respiratory problem. So they were very much impaired on their ability to do a lot of duty, especially uh, after they'd been in and doing their uh, service for several months. You're, you're getting tired, you're not getting good diet, so your resistance is getting lowered, you're susceptible for, to disease. So you're fighting every day just to keep going. It was, it's kind of sad stories to read about some of the uh, different guys and what they did and the sacrifice they made uh, for the cause at that time. That's a lot I, that I have on the uniform uh, right now. If you have some specific questions, uh, I can go through that. We can go through a loading procedure if you'd like that. I got a question. We'll go back sure. to shoes. What yeah. are the metal? Do it, why is the metal on the heel? The, the heels? metal there is to help reduce wear of the heels, the heels okay. and also give you a little traction in, in mud. But that's why they use the metal heel plates in there. It would just hold, hold up and they would uh, nail those all together. So, yeah. Well, and on Civil War battlefields, they, you would find those periodically too. Most of this, uh, <coughs> your uniform and equipment looks like original. Is it original? It's, uh, it's not original. And uh, it's, there's a lot of different companies and it's a, this is very available through different manufacturers that make these type of items. And some of the most valuable things in Civil War museums are the clothing because they didn't hold up. Guns are very, I mean, you look at them, they're $2,500 or $3,000 maybe for a, an original Civil War gun. But you look at a, a sack coat like this that would have been very common, they made millions of these, they'd be at somewhere in the neighborhood of ten dollars to $30,000. Wow. And officers even more because they're fabric and they just didn't hold up yeah. for over the 150 years since the Civil War. So. Yeah. What did a, you say that's an Enfield? Enfield rifle, right. What, what did that cost back then? Uh, it was about $10. $10. $10. <laughs> that's interesting you mentioned that because $10 was the cost of an Enfield back then. World War II, an a, a, uh, M1 was right around $112, $113 yeah. to manufacture at that time. So they had a little bit of inflation. Um, I'm going to talk about this in a little more detail, but these were um, uh, pretty accurate weapons out to 200 yards. And uh, smoothbore would be, uh, it would be not too accurate under 50 yards, which was typically used. So the tactics of the time were thinking of close range, but they were actually very accurate out at a distance. And a lot of these people, uh, the units, it was a sad thing. They had a supply problem at the early part of the war. They would be issued rifles, but yet no ammunition. Or they would have no rifles, no ammunition, and they would just be given sticks to go out into uh, the field and hope that they would get their weapons by the time they uh, were into combat. Yeah. And they had very, very little training. A lot of times combat was their training. They'd maybe march around a little bit. So, uh, How often would they be in combat? I mean, this average, what... Uh the early part of the war, not too much, but during uh, 1863, 1864 was very busy. Starting probably the middle of 1862, the action picked up. But a lot of the Union units saw no action at all, but some units saw heavy action, just depending on where they were. But a lot of the troops were used to secure areas and also just to maintain the supply supplies, the vast number of supplies that were required. In the winter time, is that all they had to wear in the winter time? We also, this is kind of a quote summer uniform, but we also had a great coat, uh, which was a, a long below the knee coat, it had a big cape on it you could flip over your head, and uh, heavy double rolled sleeves, you could roll your sleeves down, and that's really pretty comfortable coat. I've been out in the winter time when it's pretty cold, but they would wear that. Combat operations really took place very, very rarely in the winter time. That was, they kind of shut things down and were in winter camp. Uh, during the winter months, just because it was so hard to get out. You, of course, these were muzzle-loading weapons. You had to have dexterity of your fingers to feel what you were doing. Uh, just the clothing wasn't suitable to be out extended period of time, so they would usually just have a winter camp. Yeah. I, I, I never knew that. No. <laughs> I thought it was year-round. No. 
they would have these big winter camps, so they just send the guys home for the, the winter time. <laughs> uh, just because it was so hard to get around. And then the yeah. muddy conditions, especially down south, it was impossible to get through the mud and the yeah. slop down there. The, the rain like we have today uh, with all these flooded fields and all, it's dif difficult to yeah. maneuver and get around. How does, how does that bayonet attach to the... Yeah, bayonet just sl slips <clears throat> on the end of the barrel like that. It has a, a locking uh, lug and well, you're all set. Yeah. And like I said, this was used very rarely in combat. It was mainly as a tool, but it was intimidating looking too. Yeah, sure. If you had that on your uh, rifle, it was pretty intimidating looking. And they would use that for uh, dress parades. If we could um, kind of compare and contrast, the Western soldier was a kind of a rough, rowdy bunch, and uh, they were not as well disciplined as the Eastern troops and not as showy and, and fancy, but they were real fighters. They, they would really uh, perform well. Uh, they were very vigorous. They were very determined fighters. And uh, they were uh, looked down upon at the beginning of the war by the Eastern generals and Eastern officers, but they proved themselves in a lot of different battles as far as being very uh, determined and very strong fighters, and especially from the, the Midwest area here. I've seen that uh, Fort Wayne had 10,000 people living in, uh, in, uh, in Fort Wayne at that time, and 4,000 and some went to battle, I mean, enlisted. From, from Allen County. From Allen yeah, County, yeah, yeah 4, from Allen County. Yeah. And that was pretty typical to uh, a lot of the counties in Indiana. It was a very high percentage. Whitley County, 18, and that was a small county, yeah. uh, 1,800 served from Whitley County. And they served in units uh, all over the place. It wasn't just Indiana. It could have been in Minnesota or Ohio or Michigan or Illinois. And uh, that was typical. The Indiana was a big uh, contributor to the uh, Union cause during the Civil War. Yeah. We had a Brigadier General come and talk to us at one of our Korean yeah. uh, meetings. And he said, Indiana has more enlistments and reenlistments than any state in the United States. And he said, that's been since the Civil War. Isn't that something? Yeah. Well, that's something to be proud of. We're, yeah. I think we're pretty patriotic in Indiana here. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Now, one thing that I didn't show on here, this would have been something else to carry, would have been a dog tent. And these dog tents are, are usually, <clears throat> each soldier had a half, and they had buttons on them. Uh, they were about five feet long, and they were about three feet wide. And you'd have a partner, and you'd button these together, and you would stay in there for shelter. And a lot of the units didn't even have tents. That was just something extra to carry. But if you had a tent, that's how that would work. Well, it hasn't changed any. That's, yeah. That's what we use, yeah. too. And it, it's kind of funny when you have a, a guy that um, uh, is a pretty tall guy. His feet or head are sticking out one end oh. or the other. And uh, the term during the Civil War, they called them dog tents. And it, during the more current times, they call them pup tents, but the name dog tents because the soldiers would come out when the officers would go by and they would bark like dogs because it was like a dog shelter. So that's how the name dog tent got started during the Civil War. That's something I wanted to ask and I forgot what it was. <laughs> Was you going to show us how to how you load those? Yeah, let's let's go through the loading procedure. This was something that the uh, soldiers were trained uh, very rigorously on. Ideally, they were to fire three rounds a minute in one of these rifles accurately. Now, that rarely occurred. You can imagine being in battle; you're getting jostled around, uh, people getting hit by you, uh, mass confusion, and a lot of different varied conditions. So you had to go uh, drill and drill and drill so it became second nature. To load the rifle, extend your rifle out in front, open your cartridge pouch, here's your uh, cartridge container. I'm not going to do this, but you had to tear it with your teeth and you had to have four opposing teeth. That's where the 4F um, deferral get, came from. If you didn't have four teeth to oppose to tear the cartridge, you were excluded from military service. You would pour your uh, powder charge down there. It was also have a, a bullet included in that. Your lead bullet would go in there. Take your ramrod out, drive that to place, replace the ramrod, back into the rifle. You're back up into the ready position with your uh, percussion cap, and it's just a small percussion cap that ignited when this hammer came down and hit here, it would ignite the um, 
percussion cap and then ignite the powder. I'm not going to put that on in here. But then that would be on here. It would be uh, ready, aim, and then fire. And your rifle would discharge. You'd start all over again. So you can imagine trying to shoot that three times in a minute. Yeah. Now, we have just practiced trying to do that. That's difficult to do. You maybe can get two and a half done, but you have to be pretty good to do that. I'll bet. Yeah. And after about 10 to 12 rounds firing its black powder, the barrel becomes very fouled and it's very hard to drive the charge back down into the barrel. So you can imagine in a battle scenario, people say, well, you only carried 40 rounds. Well, you may not, you may only be able to shoot 10 to 12 rounds effectively and then maybe you have to take time out to clean the rifle out so you can begin firing again. And then if you had a misfire, well, you're looking for another rifle. You just throw it down and look for another rifle because yeah. you can't have time to, to be looking for that. Yeah. And in the battle scenario, they on the battlefield of Gettysburg, they picked up all the rifles. They found some of the rifles had 10 rounds of, of charges in there that had never been fired. In the heat of battle, they do, weren't even aware that the uh, rifle went off, so they just kept reloading and reloading and reloading in there. So the chaos of, of battle was... Uh -huh. uh, yeah was pretty crazy back yeah. then. You know, I, I should have brought it along. I, had a, I looked up the information on the dog tag one time, and that's when the, during the Civil War is when actually the dog tag started. Mm -hmm. Guys would write their name and their outfit on a piece of paper or something and pin it to the inside of their uniform because they didn't want to be out there not sure. knowing sure. who they was. And in some of them, this is a little sideline, but, and it's kind of a sad thing too, they would pay an undertaker back home uh, X dollars for a burial, and then they would, the, the undertaker would issue it a tag for them or a, a, a token, and they would have that on them. So if they were killed, uh, they were to be taken, and the undertaker would take care of all the details on the, the getting them home and, and uh, getting them presentable for a burial. So I'm sure a lot of the uh, that didn't really happen because of the circumstances, but uh, it was a marketing tool, I guess, for the funeral business back then. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, didn't uh, they have a lot of nurses? Were they on the front lines? And women? Uh, women, and actually, we have uh, Mother George in uh, Fort Wayne, buried at Lindenwood, and mm -hmm. she was a, a nurse during the Civil War and a, a very great assistant. But they didn't have them on the front lines, but they were in the back line. And since you're in the Navy, I've got a great trivia thing here. Okay. The USS Red Rover was the first hospital ship that was in the Ohio River and uh -huh. Mississippi. And the uh, nurses, and actually the first female nurses, the first black female nurses, were trained at St. Mary's, <coughs> Notre Dame, and they were placed on board that Red Rover to take care of the uh, soldiers. They had surgical suites on there, they had recovery areas, and they would be treating these soldiers as they moved them up to different hospitals at Cairo, Illinois, and also New Albany, Indiana. And New Albany had a, a quite a nice hospital facility there, Naval Hospital there in New, New Albany. And that was, a, that design, I'm getting a little sidetracked, but that design was copied for years and the Germans copied that de design also. So, but the females did play a major role in the Civil War. And they were trained at St. Mary's up by Notre Dame. Yeah, you know yeah. And those were tra actually trained nurses. At the beginning of the war, they, there was resistance on having women in the field, but later on they really saw the value. And Florence Nightingale was one of them in England that w showed that that was uh, very important to have uh, proper nursing staff. Here in Allen County, they had Camp Allen out here where they trained yeah. troops. Did Whitley County have a, have a, uh, a special place to train troops, or did they bring them here to... Uh... They brought them to Allen County or go to Indianapolis, uh, you know, where they had more of a center. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I know there's a million things I wanted to, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wanted to ask. So I should have taken notes. Yeah. Oh, that buckle, it's, it's got U.S. on it. Yeah. What did the Confederates have? The Confederates had C.S., and then uh, if they didn't have their own belt buckle and they would steal one or capture one, they would reverse that so it would be an upside down U.S. in their uniforms. But they used a lot of the United States material.
Were their colors gray or like, like you usually see in the shows? Or? It was gray or butternut. Gray mm -hmm. troops were, uh, that was kind of unusual, but a lot of them just had butternut. And that was using walnut hulls to dye their clothing because they just didn't have the resources like the North did. Yeah. Were they equipped with the same kind of guns? or? Uh, the South did have many infields and they bought most of their weapons from uh, England and they also uh, helped themselves to the uh, Harper's Ferry Arsenal and took all the machinery uh, at the beginning of the war and uh, utilized some of that to make their own weapons. But they had shortages, much more so than the North. It was a difficult time for the South. You talked about, uh, said something about the three inch uh, gun that, uh, that would shoot 900 yards. Right. That's a uh, ordnance rifle and artillery piece. It's a three inch diameter and rifled. It was extremely accurate. And it was a very uh, common uh, field piece to have an artillery battery. And uh, the artillery is the infantryman's friend. <laughs> we like to have the artillery yeah. right around us. <laughs> yeah. That amazes me, a three inch uh, in diameter like that. No. Accurate at 900 very, yards? Very, very, very accurate. And they would have a maximum range of about 2,000 yards, wow. but accurate up to 900 yards. And many of the infantrymen would, would flow over and help out their artillery also. That was a pretty versatile uh, group. You needed to have people, took about six to eight people to operate an uh, uh, artillery piece, so infantry people would need to be over there to help them, and they would also guard the uh, artillery pieces as the men are working as a favorite target for opposing forces to shoot at the artillery. So our job as infantry would be to screen and protect the uh, artillery people. What was that three inch, what did you call it, a three inch rifle? Ordnance rifle. Rifle. Ordnance rifle. It was about 800 pounds for the tube, and the, the carriage and tube together was probably about 2,300 pounds. And they it wasn't on wheels, though. Yes, it was on wheels. On wheels. Right, drawn by four or six horses. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. I think and a case on? Case on on it, sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. You yeah. know what? I didn't know what a case on was until I, I got out of the service. <laughs> <laughs> I was in artillery. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and they could fire probably about two rounds a minute with one of those. It was pretty amazing. They had a pretty rapid rate of fire also. I guess. Yeah. That was basically the same Loading as, as a rifle. Sure, yeah. sure. Just on a bigger scale. And they had more people to do it, so it was a very orchestrated, very precise way of doing that. Yeah. yeah. Was you going to, well, probably don't have time now. You said something about showing us more of the uniform. Oh, uh, that's pretty much it, unless I just took my uh, clothes off here. So, but you just had uh, trousers and, of course, suspenders on there and your shirt, and this, and uh, in the winter months you would maybe wear a vest also, but that would be optional. Yeah. As a poor Midwestern farmer, you just didn't have time to, and money to afford all that. Okay. Well, we're out of time, yeah. Russell. I appreciate you being here today. Mm -hmm. It's been real interesting. To the viewers, uh, I hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, I've already asked uh, Dr. Gilliam to come back for another show to continue. So I hope you join us. And I know you've heard this a lot of times, but remember, if you, have, if you see a veteran, walk up to him and shake his hand and say thank you for your service. Remember, freedom is not free.